University of Copenhagen and uh, he's the professor uh, of uh, the production development and uh, he has uh, very good experiences and very long experiences working with the uh, embryos of the different animal species. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this lecture is mainly about uh, his experience and, uh, <coughs> and uh, giving us an introduction to what it is like to be a scientist for uh, quite a long time and how the science world has changed. So, thank you. Thank you very much for the nice introduction, Monica. And thank you very much for inviting me to come here and to share some time with me today. Uh, also, hi to Aliresa <laughs> in the distance. Um, I know that uh, you're, most of you are his students somehow. And uh, uh, I know that Aliresa, he has this uh, Syrian style of relaxed uh, communication when you have seminars, etc. So I think we'll try to adapt that also here. So if you have any questions or any comments, then please uh, interrupt me and we can discuss uh, the subjects that uh, would be of interest for you, uh, because uh, this should be uh, an hour or so uh, that would be uh, for your favor. So when uh, Ali Reza asked me uh, to speak today, uh, then I thought that uh, when Alireza requests of you to tell something about your life experiences, not about oocytes and embryos, <coughs> but about your life experiences with oocytes and embryos, mm -hmm. then, uh, then, then, then you realize that, that you're getting old, because it's uh, a matter of, uh, of decades we're talking about. So we'll try to, to put in some information about uh, some of the research we've done, but also some of the personal experiences that I've had over these years with oocytes and embryos. So, <coughs> I come from Copenhagen, this is Denmark, uh, uh, this is the island of Sealand, and over here that's where the capital Copenhagen is located, uh, and that's where the University of Copenhagen is located also. And that's also where we find the anatomy building, looking like this. Uh, that's part of the uh, University of Copenhagen, that's where I'm located. So uh, basically, I share my time between teaching veterinary students anatomy. So that's in this part of the building over here where we have a big dissection uh, room, uh, where we have horses, cattle, and pigs, dogs, cats, etc. for anatomy teaching, like this horse, for example. And in the other end of the building, uh, we have uh, different laboratories for stem cell culture, uh, oocyte, uh, embryo culture, and uh, uh, procedures for staining and uh, microscopy evalu evaluation of these oocytes and embryos and stem cells. So in the basement, I have an electron microscope looking like this, uh, and that's uh, my favorite equipment, which I'll come back to also. So oocytes and embryos, uh, uh, um, already back in the late 1500s or early 1600s, uh, William Harvey uh, expressed that ex ovo omnia, all things come from the egg. Uh, that, that's, a, of course, a very fascinating structure to look into this egg where everything comes from. Uh, part of the background for understanding uh, the egg and uh, it's uh, fantastic, fantastic biology. That is uh, also uh, the history about how the egg was found. And uh, this uh, uh, Dutch guy from Delft, Reitner de Graaf, he lived in the 16, 1600s. And he's normally uh, the one that you think about when you uh, think about who identified uh, the mammalian egg. But actually what he did identify, that was the follicle, the antral follicle. He did not see the egg. He only saw the antral follicle on the ovary and uh, thought that that must be the egg, uh, the antral follicle. Uh, he actually confirmed that by tasting uh, the follicular fluid and that somehow tasted a bit like, like, like uh, yolk 
from an egg. So he was quite sure that he found the egg. But it was not uh, until much later, about 100 years later, uh, that um, then that uh, Karl Erst von Baer, he actually opened the follicle and saw that the egg came out of the follicle. And he was from Estonia. Uh, he was a medical doctor from Estonia. So he was the first one to actually see the true egg. Uh, he had done his studies at the uh, Imperial University of Dorpat. I don't know how to pronounce it correctly. How do you pronounce it? Dorpat. Okay, which was, which was formerly Tartu. Is that right also? Mm -hmm. That's good. So he opened the, uh, the Gryphian egg, which is the follicle. He opened the follicle, and he was the first one to see the oocyte or the egg coming out. And actually, last time I was here, I think we talked about that uh, in the Tomb Hill in Tartu, there is this uh, monument uh, with uh, Karl Ernst von Baer. I've not had the time to visit it we yet. We will go. We will go, <laughs> even though it's cold. Uh, we will go <laughs> to see that uh, monument. That's good. That's yeah. good. That's on the list of yes. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Uh, so just to get a bit back to me, because that was also a request from uh, that I could bring in a couple of information about myself. Then I'm born in a small fishing village called Skagen, which is, if we look at the map of Denmark again, then we have sea land here, and this is the mainland of Denmark called Jutland, and just at the very tip of that, that's where we have this small fishing village uh, called Skagen. It looks like this, it's completely flat, and out here there is a big harbor uh, nowadays, and at the end of the city, uh, towards north, uh, that's where Denmark ends. This is the uh, group of uh, stem cells in embryology, my research group, uh, at this location in the sand dunes uh, close to the, uh, to the waterfront. And I think I've tried to take a few small advices with me uh, along in this presentation also. And uh, somehow the first advice that I could think about was that growing up in these, uh, at this small place, uh, with this magnificent nature that makes you humble. Uh, this is the end of Denmark uh, up here. This is the very northern end of Denmark. Two waters come together here and there's always a nice uh, sea view over this part because the two waters of uh, Skagerrak out here and Kattegat, uh, they come together here north of Denmark. And I think it's, 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 very, uh, it's very important to keep this uh, humble uh, attitude throughout your life uh, that will help you a lot when you get uh, uh, together with other people, when you become a team player, as we'll talk about later in different uh, uh, research settings, uh, then uh, uh, remain humble towards your uh, research area and also towards the people that uh, surround you. That's a good, uh, uh, a good strategy and a good uh, human characteristic to maintain, I think. Then, uh, uh, when I was uh, 18 years old, I moved from Skagen to Copenhagen in order to start my DBM, uh, which I completed in 1979. Uh, this is uh, the uh, place where I was doing my studies uh, in Copenhagen. This is now part of University of Copenhagen, but at that time when I started there and studied there, uh, it was called the Royal Veterinary and Agricultural University. It was an independent university. Uh, educating uh, 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 veterinarians and other uh, candidates for the uh, for the uh, agricultural industry. So this was where my studies were performed, and I had lots of hours uh, used in the dissection hall over here as a student learning anatomy at that time. One interesting thing is that uh, this is a historical place. Somehow the old Royal Veterinary and Agricultural University. And after I became professor of anatomy myself and somehow work in this building, uh, I have looked back into some of the old photographs of the area. And if we look at this building, uh, then that was built in uh, 1893, it says up here. Uh, and the picture taken from uh, 1908 uh, is this one. This is the building over here. This is a blacksmith that we had at the same campus also. This is the anatomy building, anatomy building the same as this just uh, seen from this angle over here. So this is the anatomy building. And if you enter the anatomy building here, you get into this big dissection room that's inside this part of the building. And looking into that uh, in 1908, 
it looked like this. Uh, so the uh, dissection room is almost the same as it is today. The tables are different. Uh, there are more, much more women yes. than men nowadays. <laughs> uh, at this time, uh, of the, uh, of the, uh, about uh, uh, 100 years ago, it was only, only men studying uh, for becoming veterinarians. One aspect is that this watch is still hanging on the same pillar over here, so it's completely the same. That, that gives some sort of a feeling of continuity and, uh, and uh, uh, history, uh, which is very good in a very complex university setting as we have nowadays, because things change so quickly. At the University of Copenhagen, things change so quickly that we don't even always remember the name of our department any longer. I don't know whether you recognize that here in Estonia, but things they uh, reorganize uh, very rapidly, uh, which was not, uh, uh, which was quite different from uh, the time uh, in 1908. So it's always good to be reminded about these old uh, traditions uh, by looking at this uh, watch hanging at the same location. So these uh, studies to become a DVM, they were quite harsh. I, I think you probably know the same situation from other studies here in Estonia. You have to focus and you have to be, uh, you have to endure a lot of uh, hours in uh, hard study programs like this dissection hall, for example. So I think uh, what I learned from this DVM program was how to keep focus and how to uh, have a certain degree of endurance that, uh, that will be uh, uh, attitude that you can uh, gain a lot from uh, over the rest of your life. One thing that I got from this endurance was in 2016, uh, you may recognize this mountain, uh, that is uh, Mount Kilimanjaro in Tanzania, just at the border between Tanzania and, uh, and, uh, 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 and uh, what is the, just north of Tanzania, that's, that's, um, that is, uh, Oh, I forgot that now. We'll come back to that. But this is uh, at least in, in the Tanzanian side of the border, so that's okay. So uh, in 2016, we climbed Kilimanjaro, and this is from the summit of Kilimanjaro, uh, which is 5,895 uh, meter. Kilimanjaro, that's the tallest uh, single standing mountain on Earth, so it's quite uh, exciting to go there and uh, see things from that summit. So that was uh, the DBM, and then I continued uh, on the PhD. That was a bit of a coincidence, because I just, <coughs> at that time point, I would like to stay in Copenhagen, and uh, there was an opportunity to start a PhD. So I was not particularly uh, um, focused on uh, having a PhD at that time, but I certainly, during the PhD program, I got very much interested in cattle reproduction and electromicroscopy. So that was uh, the, um, the, um, the uh, aim uh, of my PhD program, that was to study repeat breeding in cattle, and uh, I had lots of uh, experiments with uh, cattle and uh, uh, reproduction at that time. Then uh, in Denmark there's an opportunity to continue uh, your uh, scientific career by extending on top of the PhD with a Doctor of Veterinary Science, and that was what I did uh, on to 1988. And at that time, uh, things became <coughs> really ex very exciting for me because I got into a very uh, good small team. Uh, and you can see the team here, and uh, uh, my mentor, who is standing in the middle here, that's Torben Greve. Some of you may have heard about him. Uh, he was a fantastic mentor for me, and so somehow he he uh, saw us as the uh, three musketeers. Uh, this is a picture taken back from 1983. Uh, these are the three musketeers. I think Torben uh, considered himself self as Portus, which is the fighter uh, of these three musketeers. Uh, and then uh, we had Henry Callison along with us here. He was a bit more uh, into religion and uh, a very, uh, very quiet type. So he was armies in, this, uh, in these three musketeers, whereas Torben considered me as being a bit more uh, for the wine and, and fun part of the, the science. 
for the least this uh, created a lot of good um, uh, uh, studies, good research for us, and we got this fantastic uh, collaboration and with this uh, extremely good mentor, Torben Greve, as I'll come back to a bit later. It was still in the anatomy building, and I started to do more electron microscopy, so I focused my uh, time in this electron microscopy room in the basement of the building over here, and started looking at the uh, oocytes and embryos in order to understand oocyte maturation and fertilization in cavern. Uh, so this is the immature oocyte uh, uh, semithin section uh, with the zona pellucida there and the oocyte nucleus, the germinal vesicle located here. And we started looking into the uh, finer structure of this oocyte by electron microscopy. This is one part of the oocyte with the zona pellucida there here and the uh, oocyte nucleus. Here are lots of mitochondria and, and um, cortical granules that will uh, prevent polyspermic fertilization of the oocyte. Later, we could dig into all these small organelles of the oocyte, which was quite fascinating. Also, we looked at the process of fertilization at that time, so we started looking into the oviducts to find the sperm, uh, which were on their way to find the, uh, the egg. This is a bovine sperm uh, migrating up uh, through the oviduct. You can see the ciliated cells of the oviduct here beside the sperm. And eventually, we could also visualize by scanning electron microscopy the fertilization. Uh, when we have the oocyte here, lots of cumulus cells are still attached to the oocyte. But you can see free areas of the zona pellucida there also with uh, sperm uh, sitting on it, sperm head, sperm tail, sperm head, and sperm tail uh, that are now uh, digging into the oocyte. At that time, we started to look more and more into in vitro fertilization, in vitro oocyte maturation, in vitro fertilization, and in vitro culture of the resultant embryos. And um, uh, that resulted in the first European in vitro produced calf. That was back in 1987 that was uh, reported. Uh, so this is uh, the, these are the small droplets in which oocyte maturation was performed at that time. And uh, this is, again is my mentor, Torben Greve, who is ready to do the, uh, the uh, non surgical embryo transfer uh, 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 with the embryo sitting now in the, in the transfer uh, catheter uh, at the end here. And this is the first in vitro produced calf in Europe. Uh, uh, the calf was named after a uh, Chinese scientist that we had at that time that matured about 15,000 oocytes in order to get to this calf. So the calf was uh, named Kang Pu after this uh, Chinese who was the first author of this uh, publication. With respect to Torben Greve, then uh, uh, I think we all have to speculate about the past in, in, in the sense uh, that uh, uh, this small uh, sentence from Isaac Newton uh, says that if we have seen, if I have seen further than others, it is by standing upon the shoulders of giants. And I think we can thank our mentors and those that were before us for the uh, developments uh, that we are contributing to ourselves. Uh, we have been helped a lot by former uh, generations, and uh, I think we should be thankful to their, uh, to, the, to the platform they have created for us. So I would like to thank Torben, uh, at least, for his mentorship uh, for me. And that brings me on to uh, the next small advice that good science is based upon, upon uh, curiosity, teamwork, trust, and great fun also. And I think it's always important to acknowledge your mentors and also your peers for their contributions. So uh, again, that uh, has a bit to do with the humble attitude uh, that you uh, try to uh, respect and acknowledge those that uh, have created the basis for your own success also. So then continuing on in time, um, this was uh, after the, uh, or during the studies for the Doctor of Veterinary Science. Uh, then a few years later, a couple of years later, I, I became Professor of Anatomy um, and we started to look more into uh, still in vitro production of embryos, but also into cloning by somatic cell nuclear transfer. Still, the anatomy building was the um, was the uh, center of 
the activities, uh, but I had to share my time uh, not only in the uh, electron microscopy room down here, but also doing more teaching uh, as a professor of anatomy in this part of the building, which was the dissection room. Uh, so this is from the scene from the dissection room. But we did continue the in vitro production of the bovine embryos. This is an immature oocyte. After 24 hours, it looks like this uh, fully matured oocyte ready for fertilization. Uh, and uh, during that time, uh, from the 90s and onwards to year 2000, uh, lots of embryos were produced in Denmark. But then uh, in 1997, there was a report uh, given at the uh, International Embryo Transfer Society meeting in uh, Nice. And uh, at that report, uh, it, became, it became quite clear that cloned offspring and also in vitro produced offspring, uh, they might suffer from this large offspring syndrome. Uh, and that created a lot of um, problems in Denmark because at that time we were uh, aiming at uh, trying to implement in vitro production of bovine embryos in cattle breeding in Denmark. But that was due, due to ethical reasons and the, um, and the risk of having these large offspring syndrome calves born. Uh, uh, due to ethical reasons around that, uh, this uh, implementation of in vitro production was stopped uh, immediately at that time. Uh, so uh, that blocked our research quite severely at that time uh, uh, regarding the in vitro production of, of embryos. So um, we started looking into ways of determining embryo quality uh, from different angles, and um, uh, particularly uh, my area, uh, we started to look more into the nucleolus, uh, which is the ribosome factory of a cell, uh, and how that uh, is organized in oocytes and embryos. This is a uh, fertilized one cell porcine zygote. You can see the two pronu pronuclei up here. Uh, if we look into the pronuclei by electron microscopy, uh, you'll see that the, uh, the um, nucleolus is just a, a dark uh, ball here without any activity. It is a completely inactive nucleolus, nucleolus uh, not synthesizing any ribosomes. So somehow there might be something about the nucleolus that could identify and tell you something about the activity in the, <coughs> in the uh, zygote and in the embryo and about the health of the zygote and the embryo. Uh, if you look a bit to the side of this, uh, of this uh, pronucleus here, you could actually see that this would be, for example, the male pronucleus because you could find the sperm tail just beside this uh, pronucleus by the electron microscope. When we look into the later stage embryos, like the fossil stage, when the genomic activation uh, has taken place in pig, in pig, the embryonic genome is activated at the fossil stage, uh, then you would find a uh, nucleus looking like this, completely different. This is a reticulated nucleus consisting of uh, particular fibular uh, structures here and here. And then it's lots of small granules, as you can see here. And all these small granules, they are the uh, subunits of the ribosomes. So this is a very active ribosome uh, synthesizing nucleus, you can see here. So somehow the Nucleolus could be used as a marker of oocyte and embryo quality. We looked into uh, this very detailed uh, during development. So these are in vivo developed porcine embryos. And as you can see here at, at the four cell stage, the nucleolus is activated from this uh, quiescent uh, fibular structure here into a fully functional uh, ribosome synthesizing nucleolus which is also found at the eight cell stage and, and at the moral stage. If you look at the cloned embryos and compare them with in vivo embryos, these are the in vivo embryos that you just saw, then in the cloned embryos you can see uh, the uh, nucleolus is still inactive at the four cell stage, inactive at the eight cell stage, and it's not activated until the blastocyst stage. So somehow the nucleolus is indicative of the embryo quality. So at that time, we became more and more interested also uh, during the uh, 
early 2000, we became more and more interested in what is underlying this embryo quality with respect to epigenetic uh, patterning. And uh, this is uh, a scientist called Conrad Waddington, and he, is, he was the one that in the, uh, in the publication by, uh, in 1957 defined somehow the area of epigenetics. And this is an illustration from his publication at that time, uh, where he imagined that uh, uh, the potent cells uh, in the embryo would have uh, one type of epigenetic landscape deciding for their pluripotency, and that when they, uh, like uh, balls rolling down these different valleys, go to differentiation, uh, that the epigenetic patterning is changing and bringing the cells into different states of differentiation. So that was uh, his uh, early um, uh, conception of epigenetics. And when I talk about epigenetics, I uh, favor to use a uh, couple of slides that I'll just show you here because that will take us to a travel to uh, New York. Uh, uh, just uh, east of New York there is this Long Island uh, and on Long Island if we look at that uh, uh, and go to the north coast up here of Long Island uh, you can find uh, at the beach this bungalow. Uh, that's the bungalow of James Watson who was, uh, uh, he was one of the two Watson and Crick, uh, who in, I think, 1951 or, four, or 40, 49, described the DNA double helix. So he's still around. Um, and this is his bungalow. And he was, uh, he was the director of a, uh, a research center, uh, Cold Spring Harbor Laboratories, which is located here at the northern uh, coast of uh, Long Island. And if you go to his, uh, towards his bungalow and uh, position yourself uh, at the point of this tree and look in the other direction, then you'll see a small hill looking like this. Uh, and on this small hill there is this uh, monument which you can clearly recognize as a DNA double helix. And somehow when I talk about the epigenetics, then I envision myself as some sort of an epigenetic mark uh, an epigenetic modification uh, that is trying to activate this part of the DNA uh, to be expressed. So that is how epigenetic works, that uh, these uh, mechanisms are operated by molecules that are attached to the DNA directly or uh, uh, proteins that the DNA are coiled about. Uh, we looked into different aspects of uh, DNA methylation, for example, which is one of the inhibiting uh, uh, epigenetic marks and we found that in vivo porcine embryos uh, they had much less um, DNA methylation than in vitro produced porcine embryos uh, which also fits with the fact that in vitro produced porcine embryos they are not so viable as in vivo produced porcine embryos they are. So here we see uh, immunosorial chemical staining of uh, methylated DNA. Then, uh, uh, in order to continue a bit with the cloning, uh, then in 2000, 2001, I had a sabbatical in Australia. This is from Great Ocean Road, which is a fantastic place. Uh, and then I met this uh, guy here. Uh, I don't know whether you recognize him, any of you, but uh, this is a scientist, Hungarian scientist. He's upside down here. Uh, his name is uh, Gabor Weiter. And Gabor, he was, uh, he was a very uh, inventory guy and he was uh, uh, always thinking about uh, technologies that would help us uh, in, in, in an easy and smart way. Uh, so Gabor was at that time in Australia, uh, early 2000, he was studying uh, how, to, how to simplify the uh, somatic cell nuclear transfer cloning procedure. Uh, and uh, apart from uh, making this uh, bumpy jump, as you can see here, then he developed a uh, particular uh, cloning technology, which is referred to as handmade cloning. And he designed uh, uh, a bit, uh, uh, just to illustrate the fun part of it, he designed this cloning kit, uh, which can be used on the kitchen uh, table, actually, to clone uh, by means of. Uh, the simple idea is that instead of using a micro manipulator 
for enucleating an oocyte and putting a somatic cell into the enucleated oocyte. Then uh, he decided to use a small scalpel blade, looking like this, for bisecting uh, the oocytes. Uh, and on the next picture here, you can see how he manually uh, is able to bisect these oocytes by this uh, scalpel blade. Uh, you should remember, of course, that these oocytes, they are about 120 microns in diameter, so it takes quite a, uh, uh, a skillful hand to be able to cut these oocytes. Uh, but that was uh, least possible. And uh, Gabor transferred this technology back to Denmark. He was Hungarian, as I said, but he worked in Denmark for quite some years. And he transferred the technology back to Denmark and uh, several uh, porcine uh, or pig clones were produced in Denmark. Mostly uh, these were genetically modified uh, uh, pig clones that would serve as uh, biomedical models for uh, human diseases. These are some of the first cloned pigs in Denmark from the summer 2006 and I think, I think this one was the first one to come out and uh, Gabor named him George Cloney. <laughs> so that was a small, healthy ground pig at that time. So um, I think by traveling uh, to Australia and other places, uh, and also realizing that uh, in order to promote the uh, research activities that we had in Denmark at that time, we needed uh, a lot of funding. Uh, so uh, this was the next item that I brought up here. Um, uh, funding is required uh, and I think uh, over my lifetime in research uh, funding has been uh, has become available uh, by uh, by building different consortia I think it's very important throughout your research career to think about how to build consortia and how to maintain uh, uh, alliances uh, that are the basis of such consortia uh, you may do that in different research area, and I think you should think about these consortia as being for <coughs> life and try to maintain them because uh, that is something that will give you uh, 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 give you very good opportunities for applying for funding from both, both national sources but also international sources, sources like the EU, for example. You need uh, 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 to have uh, well-established consortia in order to uh, apply for funding and be successful in applying for funding uh, from, for example, the EU. So think about that and try to try to keep uh, uh, your consortia for life and to consolidate them as well as you can. Then uh, after having uh, used time on looking at uh, mutant production and somatic cell nuclear transfer embryos, then gradually we started to move into uh, the biology of the embryo and also into the uh, particular biology of the inner cell mass and uh, uh, isolated cells from the inner cell mass that could be cultured as embryonic stem cells. So that gave us uh, uh, a, uh, some activities in bovine and porcine embryonic stem cell uh, culture uh, and from that we moved on into the porcine induced pluripotent stem cells, still focusing on, uh, on, on on animal species. So this is from some of the first studies that we did on the porcine embryonic stem cells. This is a porcine day 5 embryo from which we can isolate the inner cell mass uh, and we could culture these uh, outgrowth colonies. This is day 7 outgrowth colonies uh, and then we could culture these colonies quite uh, uh, quite well and, uh, and also um, uh, 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 passage them for quite a number of passages but uh, we lost pluripotency. So we could not really say that these are porcine embryonic stem cells. Uh, there's a big question mark here, and I think uh, it has been very frustrating for us at that time to work with these uh, embryonic stem cell-like <coughs> cells from the pig, uh, because they were really difficult to maintain and they lost pluripotency over passages. So we moved into uh, induced pluripotent stem cells, uh, established technologies for reprogramming of porcine fibroblast into induced pluripotent stem cells and again we could culture these cells uh, but again it's difficult to maintain pluripotency in the pig uh, and we had to uh, test many different culture conditions 
in order to find something that would uh, that would be compatible with the uh, continued polypotency. Uh, eventually, we were able to keep cells from any passages, uh, differentiate them in these um, embryoid bodies here, and uh, later after staining these embryoid bodies could give rise to different um, <coughs> germ layers, ectoderm stained by cytokeratin, mesoderm by smooth muscle actin, and endoderm by alpha fetal protein. Uh, but stem cell culture in the pig and in cattle, that's really a challenging task. And I don't think it has been really achieved yet to produce um, uh, stable uh, ESC or IPSC lines in these two species. So then uh, we saw some new opportunities in Denmark uh, for getting some funding and getting new activities. And that was that uh, at a certain point, more and more focus came on human-induced pluripotent stem cells and the potential of using these human-induced pluripotent stem cells for modeling different diseases. And we started particularly to focus on neurodegeneration, Alzheimer's disease, phototemporal dementia and Parkinson's disease. And uh, we designed a particular research program for the study of these uh, diseases using human IPS cells as models. And what we did was that uh, we applied for funding for a particular stem cell center called BrainStem, uh, which is running now. It started in 2015. It will be running uh, until the end of 2020 uh, uh, for these IPS-based modeling of dementia. And the whole uh, idea, the whole concept of this uh, research um, uh, stem cell center is that we have uh, demented patients, this could be a frontotemporal dementia patient, for example, as seen here. From these patients, we get skin fibroblasts, and these skin fibroblasts are then reprogrammed into, um, uh, into induced prepotent stem cells. Some of these patients, they have uh, familial, case, familial uh, uh, mutations causing the uh, early onset of dementia. Uh, and in these cases where we have the have well-known mutations, then we are able to uh, use CRISPR-Cas9 for uh, correcting the mutation in these uh, iPS cells <coughs> and gene-corrected uh, induced prepotent stem cells. And that gives us very good opportunities for uh, performing neural differentiation of the, uh, of the iPS cells carrying the disease-causing mutation and also those that are gene corrected and have been uh, relieved, relieved from that mutation. So we get neurons here, and by comparing these neurons, uh, uh, we have a strict comparison of the effect of this disease-causing mutation, because these gene corrected neurons, they have exactly the same genomic background. It's only the uh, single point mutation uh, that is different between the two uh, classes of neurons. So that will allow us to identify disease phenotypes, uh, different mecha mechanistic reasons for the disease, and also to look for therapeutic targets in these uh, neurons. We've had lots of uh, good activities with these human-induced prepotent stem cells. For example, looking at the IPS reprogramming by electron microscopy. Uh, so this is before reprogramming, you have the fibroblasts here. Uh, and. Uh, uh, when the fibroblasts, they are reprogrammed, we use a mixture of three different plasmids uh, with six uh, uh, transcription factors encoded. Uh, and uh, uh, by using these three plasmids, single uh, fibroblasts will be reprogrammed into induced protein stem cells and start to divide into these smaller cells, as you can see here. Uh, so this is a single uh, fibroblast that's been hit and has started dividing to these smaller cells. And on day 12, we have a nice induced pluripotent stem cell colony looking like this, consisting of uh, maybe hundreds of cells, uh, as you can see here. And on day 18, it develops further uh, into a big colony with maybe thousands of cells, as you can see here. So this, this is just a study of the uh, IPS reprogramming. But we also were able to identify disease phenotypes uh, and we've looked at many different uh, uh, phenotypes uh, of the diseases in these neurons. Uh, and just to show you one example, 
Then here uh, is electromicroscopy of these uh, neurons. So this is a patient-derived, uh, uh, IPS-derived neuron, uh, which is somehow mimicking the disease seen in the patient, uh, whereas this is the isogenic control neuron. That is a neuron where the disease-causing mutation has been corrected. And if we just look at the neurons, uh, here you can see that in this deceased neuron here with the uh, disease-causing mutation, causing dementia in an early uh, age, you can see big, uh, big, big endosomes here uh, that somehow disrupt the normal um, uh, microtubular uh, formations that will stretch into the axon. This is an axon extending here. The nucleus is found here. So in this uh, isogenic control where the disease causing mutation has been corrected, you can see that, again, the nucleus here, you can see these nice stretches of my microtubules extending into the axon here, uh, and we uh, have now somehow uh, corrected the disease and do not see these big endosomes any longer in the cytoplasm here. So there are big differences in the patient-derived neurons versus the uh, gene-corrected isogenic control neurons. So uh, now we're approaching the end of this presentation because somehow the uh, activities we had since uh, 2011, actually we started looking into human-induced pluripotent stem cells and neurodegeneration, that has somehow been a, a, a diversion from uh, my normal path as a veterinarian. It has also been a diversion from the oocytes and embryos. Uh, and somehow it was, uh, we, we, we met uh, many uh, skeptic persons around us at the uh, faculty uh, because why should we concentrate our efforts on human IPS as neurodegeneration uh, when we were at the veterinary faculty? And that could be argued. Uh, uh, but somehow it paid back anyway because at the end, uh, uh, when we got these competences of producing the IPS cells and also looking into the neurons that we could derive from them and looking into s particular uh, uh, pathologies of uh, neurodegeneration, uh, then uh, somehow these, these products, they fed back to us because we were able to apply for and get funding for a, a dog project where we're going to look into canine induced pluripotent stem cells and look into neurodegeneration in the dog also. And just to give you an example of what this uh, research project will focus on, uh, then uh, the, uh, the uh, disease we are focusing on is, is um, referred to as canine cognitive dysfunction. And it's an Alzheimer-like condition in the dog. Uh, these older dogs, they get demented. Uh, they swap around night and day. They get um, disoriented, cannot find their way around in the house any longer. Uh, so this is a rather well-defined condition in older dogs, this canine cognitive dysfunction. And we asked, asked ourselves, after we've seen so many of these human patients now and human ips derived neurons and looked into their pathologies, uh, whether these uh, dogs could you be used as a model for sporadic Alzheimer's disease. Uh, so we designed a project looking like this, that we have healthy control dogs, we have these and I'm cognitive dysfunctional dogs. We're going to look into their histopathology of the brains. We're going to produce induced pluripotent stem cells for, from each of these dogs and uh, differentiate them into neurons. And then we'd like to look into the neurons to uh, look at the pathology in these neurons and also compare these canine cognitive dysfunctional neurons with human Alzheimer neurons that we have from our brain stem, the stem cell center projects. So, um, all of this might be used for uh, in vitro drug discovery and maybe uh, finding uh, drugs that can be tested uh, on, on dogs also. But at least we got back to the veterinary faculty with a new project uh, uh, regarding uh, the dog as a model for Alzheimer's disease. And we would never have gotten this project without this diversion into the human IPS field. So uh, uh, somehow, uh, I realized that the strategy for development of competences as fu and funding is not always so uh, straight ahead. Uh, because mm -hmm. what we found uh, was that we started many of our activities 
in the area of veterinary sciences, and oocytes and embryos, and also stem cells from pigs and cattle. Uh, but then we uh, found ourselves in a situation where we had uh, a lack of funding for these uh, uh, embryo technologies and also for stem cell uh, research, uh, and uh, found that there might be other opportunities in medical sciences. Uh, that was where we uh, started working with the IPS models of dementia. And somehow that gave competences that fed back to our uh, activities in such a way that uh, we could get back to veterinary sciences and uh, develop uh, projects and get support for projects on canine and porcine IPS models. So somehow the, uh, it's important to realize that uh, a diversion into the medical sciences uh, may not be uh, so bad uh, and it may bring new competences, new opportunities uh, that can feed back to the veterinary uh, science area. So that's uh, one of my last uh, uh, small advices, that is to be opportunistic. Try to catch those opportunities that you can see around you uh, and do not be afraid of new challenges uh, because uh, the road of science is, is winding and somehow uh, it's difficult to say uh, which direction you will take uh, when you uh, jump onto a new road. So um, uh, try to be opportunistic and use the opportunities uh, around you. Now, I started uh, up here uh, in the early years talking about oocytes and embryos. And I've been so uh, privileged that uh, the last project we got in house, that was last year, we started uh, the 1st of December 2017. That is a project on the implementation of in vitro production and dynamic selection in Danish cattle breeding. And that is due to the fact that I talked about the large offspring syndrome and the ethical concerns in Denmark. Uh, it has now uh, somehow uh, evaporated uh, because the culture media have become much better. The large offspring syndrome has been at least decreased to such a, uh, such a small uh, thing that it is completely acceptable to implement in vitro production of embryos in cattle breeding, which is seen many places in the world. Uh, so um, uh, we got the uh, opportunity to start that in Denmark also, and we got the acceptance from the uh, farmers and uh, in particular also Viking Genetics, a big breeding company, uh, is in the project also. So now it's really supported by the industry that we try to implement in vitro production and dynamic selection in Danish cattle breeding. So somehow uh, I'm happy to be back to the cows and the embryos again after a diversion into the human stem cells where we are still having activities. But uh, it's nice to be on these two frontiers, both in the uh, human medical uh, area, uh, but also back in the uh, cows and the embryos. So this is the elite over project that we are running now. <coughs> All sites are aspirated from, uh, from really high class uh, uh, Holstein uh, dairy heifers, uh, in vitro matured, in vitro fertilized, in vitro culture. Uh, biopsies will be taken from them, we've not started on that yet, uh, otherwise they are transferred and uh, born as, uh, as these high class calves. Uh, we perform dynamic selection of the embryos at a certain point when that get implemented. And we'll be using <coughs> different um, SNPs for the genomic selection that include SNPs on uh, reduced methane emission and uh, uh, increased feed efficiency. Uh, there's a parallel project that provides these SNPs to us. So we'll be able to uh, somehow uh, put some new aspects into uh, the Nordic total merit uh, SNP uh, evaluation that is normally done. So we hope to be able to uh, to uh, create values for the breeding companies by the sales of good semen and embryos, and also by having a rapid genetic progress, including these uh, characteristics as uh, low methane emission, for example. We also hope to uh, benefit the Danish dairy producers by creating increased uh, resilience in the cattle population. Uh, we also hope to uh, uh, somehow sustain our own activities in the academia uh, by getting a forefront position in uh, embryo technology and genomic selection. 
And finally, also, uh, we hope to benefit Danish citizens and dairy consumers by having a sustainable meat production and less methane emission. So that's the last thing, the last statement I put onto this slide. Uh, that is that uh, the road of science is binding uh, and may, if you are privileged, as I feel that I am, uh, lead uh, you back to where you started. And that's the full circle. So thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions, then uh, please feel free to ask. <laughs> Yeah, please. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I have a question uh, every time I'm thinking about this. Do you believe that um, using the oversight from the slaughterhouse cow is a good tool for IVP? It means uh, when you are thinking about the future of IVP production, uh, industry, uh, oversight from the slaughterhouse cows, good tools for this purpose. Uh, about uh, <coughs> about quality, unknown epigenetic disorders, yeah. uh, very, oh, I don't know. In my country, I'm from Iran. Yeah. Uh, and uh, when mm, the cow is very awful, they go to slaughter. Yeah. And everything, I, I think that we cannot uh, keep it in the car. Mm -hmm. So this oversight from the yeah. tools, I think. Yeah, I, I, I think, I think it's, it's a very interesting question. And I, if I try to relate that to the project that we just started in Denmark, then uh, I think that um, in one sense we need slaughterhouse oversight. Uh, but that is not for production of calves. It's for somehow having a stable, uh, stable measure of how our IVP system is running and working. Mm -hmm. Because um, in this project that we are running, we need to focus on the best quality heifers for over pickup and use the best bulls for uh, fertilization. Mm -hmm. and, and use them in such a way that they are combined uh, in, a, in an intelligent way to create the best mm -hmm. next generation. So, so this is all about uh, optimizing genetic gain from one uh, from one generation to the next and using young young yeah. animals as young as possible, young heifers, young bulls. And superregulation as well, not slaughter bulls. No, size. exactly. But but using these young animals, young heifers and young bulls, but also create lots of challenges because mm -hmm. the oocyte quality and the sperm quality is much less uh, than if you have mature uh, mm -hmm. uh, animals. And therefore I think that the uh, that the uh, slaughterhouse oocytes, even though they are, they are of a big variety with respect to the follicular status, uh, mm -hmm. growing follicles, atretic follicles, slightly atretic follicles, they even give good, very good oocytes. Mm -hmm. So I think there is a big variation in the oocyte quality that you get from the slaughterhouse. But somehow, if you have enough of them and have hundreds of oocytes, then you may be able to use the slaughterhouse oocytes as some sort of a benchmark for your system okay. so that you have a continuity uh, and have a, uh, some sort of a stable measure of your blastocyst rate and quality mm -hmm. over time that you can compare with the uh, specific well-chosen but fewer oocytes you get from the, from the selected animals you like to produce calves from. Thank you. So that was another story about that. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, in Estonia, for an example, it's not allowed to transfer uh, plasticists that uh, are uh, from the slaughterhouse material. And I know it's uh, it's the same thing in many European countries, that you can't transfer the animals that you produce from the slaughterhouse material. I don't know how it is I, 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 I must admit that I, I'm not quite sure about that, actually. Yeah, yeah. because in Estonia it's uh, against the law. Yeah. Because uh, if you uh, transfer the ovaries, you uh, are not able to uh, mark the number of the cow on each ovary, so you don't exactly know the yeah. mother. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's not allowed, because uh, if you transfer the embryos, you have to know who the mother is also, yeah. not only the father. I know that in the US, it is possible to do the slaughterhouse uh, 
uh, <coughs> had uh, survived uh, um, in the transfers because the quality the quality of the herds in the U.S. is so high mm -hmm. that they are not uh, uh, in fear of getting uh, poor quality calves out of these uh, of these embryos because the calf uh, the uh, the quality of the herd is so high okay. of the animals because they have done the uh, genetic selection yeah. for yeah. so long. But I think I think I could imagine that the same situation as here would apply also in Denmark because you need to have a particular number, a particular registration for the for the offspring. Yeah. So that 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 gives a very good explanation for why this is not uh, uh, used. But otherwise, I think uh, due to practical reasons mm -hmm. also, there would be no need for using it because yeah. uh, because it's not really uh, not really sustaining the genetic progress yes. that uh, is in really focus right, in this yeah. project. Yeah. yeah. But sometimes. Uh, it would be so much easier because I also work with uh, embryos and it would be so much easier when we could do uh, transfers also yeah. to, to uh, see the further development of different uh, embryos but it's uh, the, the number of embryos that you get from home pickup is so much lower so yeah. Yeah. to get a good uh, a uh, number of samples will take a lot of time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's why sometimes that's right. I think it would be so good yeah, that yeah. when we could transfer that lot of those material also. But for the farmer's perspective, it's not so good. Not so good for them. No. <coughs> I think I, I <coughs> probably I was shocked a bit by the cold here in Tartu. <laughs> that was why I <coughs> that was why I <coughs> forgot about when I saw the, all the snow on the top of Kilimanjaro and talking about Tanzania. The, the country north of Tanzania is of course Kenya. Yeah. <laughs> so <coughs> that was due to the effect of the cold. Yeah. Cold <coughs> <Always> shock. <coughs> yeah. Not a heat shock, but a cold <laughs> shock. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> Any further questions? Then please feel free. Otherwise, yeah, about yeah, please. About the last slide. Yeah. Uh, how much do you think you can affect uh, the methane, methane uh, like emissions? Yes. Yes. That that that's a very good question because uh, I think we will try to do some calculation on that. And, and I think there is a uh, there is a quite a quite a considerable heritability on that trade actually, uh, and and also there is a genetic variation with respect to these slips that we're looking into. So the, the, there is a big variation in the population uh, uh, with more or less methane emission, and. Uh, over the past four years, there's been a big project in Denmark measuring the methane emission from these uh, cattle uh, and relating it to the SNPs because having this the phenotype related to the SNPs and having phenotypes of animals enough that's a big big uh, project of course. But uh, I'm 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 I'm. Of course, I'm, of course, I'm, of course, but I'm thinking the main effect is maybe like like what kind of microphone you have in a woman? Yes. What kind of feed? So yes. So <coughs> how, how does it... Uh, I, I, I see the point completely. Uh, and it's interesting for me also to see that uh, this microflora and the methane emission is somehow related to the to the genetic composition of the animal, obviously. Because they, they, this product that has been running for the past four years, they have found uh, quite a number of SNPs that are related to the uh, methane emission. So somehow there is a <coughs> there is a uh, contribution by the genetic composition of the animal on the rumen microbiology and on the function of this uh, of this uh, uh, microbiome on methane emission. Uh, I cannot really explain the mechanistics of yeah. that. <coughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. 
and I don't remember how much, how many, how many percentage of this. Uh, uh, the the the, the population actually uh, produces quite a considerable uh, uh, amount of methane uh, in Denmark, uh, and I think it's, I think, we anticipated to be able to reduce by about five percent per year by using these slips for reduced methane emission. <coughs> Yeah, if there are no further questions, then I won't steal more of your time. Uh, I'm thankful for you that you stayed here, all of you, and that you took time for coming and uh, share this hour with me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.